course, we're in the series, Walking as Jesus Walked. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Ushers, get one to you. And we've been going almost a year on this series. And uh, the last month or so, we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever told. And, and we looked about conflict and how to handle conflict and anger. And last week, we looked at lust and Jesus' definition of adultery. It begins in the heart. Um, and uh, an intense message. And <laughs> Jesus, the way he has it, keeps the heat on. And uh, the, next, the next passage, the very next verse, goes in and talks about divorce and uh, the implications there of uh, divorce, adultery, remarriage. What do we do with all that? And there's so much confusion in the church. And um, the pastors, we've been praying about what do we do? How do we say? What do we say? What do we say? What do we not say? This is a message that no matter what I say, somebody's going to disagree. No matter what I say, somebody's going to be offended. No matter what I say, somebody's going to be hurt. I want you to know that as we talk about the issues of divorce, remarriage, adultery, we don't come with it as a um, shoehorn where we try to fit everything in. We come to it just to let the scriptures speak. We come to it recognizing that uh, those that are going through that D word, divorce, are experiencing tremendous pain. In fact, I want you to just, just for a second, you know, think about it. Everybody in the room, everybody in the United States has been affected by divorce in some way or another. Either you've been through it. Either your parents went through it and you went through it as a child, like I did. Or you have a brother, sister, friend, neighbor that's been through it or is going through it. It's a lot of things, a lot of pain. What are some of the emotions that people experience when they go through divorce? Just shout out an emotion. Bitterness. Abandonment, yes. Bitterness, Bitterness. rejection. Anger. Anger. What else? Joy. <laughs> I noticed your wife is laughing too. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> you caught me there. <laughs> well, a lot of emotions. <laughs> a lot of emotions. But some of those other emotions, what are some other emotions? Betrayal. Failure, a fear of failure. Betrayal. Hatred, betrayal. Loneliness, sadness, so many, so many, a variety. And some of it's just, just numb. Some people, when they're going through this, they just, they, just, they just feel numb. Like they can't feel anything anymore, and they want to get out because they want to feel something again. In the church, I think we have two common errors when dealing with people that are going through divorce. First error is to look at the divorced person as a leper and that there's some kind of sin going on, and then what happens is because I don't want to condone the sin, I don't know what to say, so I don't say anything. And then we isolate the people, and we give them that silent treatment. And there's many people in the church that have gone through a divorce, and that's what they've experienced, and as a result, they, it makes it even harder. Now, the opposite extreme is that you see the people going through the divorce, and you want to somehow ease their pain, and as a result, we don't want to talk about what the scripture says. And so instead of, I, I just want to come along and say, yeah, yeah, you, you've been wronged and you've been hurt and, and I'm there for you and, and, and we'll just, you know what, God understands. Certainly God understands pain. He suffered on a cross. It doesn't get any worse than that. But God also gives some specific scriptures and, and, and give us clarity in terms of what's permissible, how to handle divorce, how not to handle divorce. In fact, when it, when it comes to a divorce, it's, we either distance ourselves from the people going through it or we distance ourselves from the scriptures. 
and say, well, you know, God understands. Yes, but God also understands, and he's given us clear guidelines. He understood. You know, when people say, well, times are different today than they were 2,000 years ago. Do you know when the Bible was written, God knew all of time? And if, if he knew that something was going to happen in the 20th century that we need, or 21st century, that we needed to know, I think he could have included it. So it says that the scriptures contain everything pertaining to life and godliness. So the, the guidelines are there. The book tells us. But we need to come with humbleness to the, the scriptures. We need to come and we need to ask, okay, God, show me. Show me. Palm Beach County doesn't make it any easier. We have one of the highest divorce rates in the country. Two out of three divorces. Two out of three marriages in Palm Beach County end in divorce. Wow. And you know the sad thing? Not many people are getting married these days. Most people are just living together. And so if that's the case, and two out of three marriages end in divorce, wow. That means they're not even counting the people that live together that consider themselves married and end up breaking up. In fact, the statistics, if you're interested, the statistics are about 80, I think it's 86% of couples that live together will eventually break up. If you get married, you at least have a 66% chance, (laughs) as opposed to 86% chance. Well, with all that said, we want, as the body of Christ, we want to come to provide compassionate care and loving confrontation. Compassionate care, loving confrontation. We need to bring both to the scriptures. And of course, we need to bring the Holy Spirit. So let's go to the Lord and ask him now. Lord God, as we talk about these sensitive topics, we need your Holy Spirit more than ever. In ourselves, we are unable to comprehend what you what you lay out in ourselves we need your spirit in ourselves we are unable to adequately comfort people to adequately guide people to adequately instruct people we need your holy spirit and lord in the midst of marriage we are inadequate in ourselves to survive we need your holy spirit so lord fill this room right now may you speak in jesus name amen Matthew 5.31, Jesus continuing without dropping a beat. Matthew 5.31, furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Now, Jesus' perspective on divorce, remember, he had just talked about lust, In fact, let's look at the list. He has a series of, you have heard that it was said. Jesus now lists the higher standard for each of these cases. The first one is, do not murder. It was said, do not murder. But Jesus amplifies it and says, to be angry with a brother is to commit murder in your heart. Okay, he takes it to a whole new standard. The next one he says, you've heard that it said, do not commit adultery. He amplifies it by saying, looking with lust is adultery of the heart. The third one. You've heard that it was said, divorce is permissible. Whoever divorces his wife, let him give a certificate of divorce. He amplifies it by saying, divorce causes adultery. Divorce causes adultery. What? Matthew 5.32, but I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. So, what is that saying? And we, we're looking at this as, well, okay, what's the reason for remarriage? No, it's saying that basically by divorcing, you're causing the wife to, get, to, to, to go into adultery. Because in that day, in that era, a woman, when she was divorced, she, couldn't, she really couldn't live by herself. She'd either have to go back to the family, go back to her father's house, or she'd have to find another husband to take care of her because that's, that was the culture. And so she's going to have to enter into adultery because she's technically married because she's married to the husband until death do his part. And notice it says, unless, except um, sexual immorality. Well, in other words, you're causing her to commit adultery unless she's already committed adultery. Is Jesus giving grounds for divorce? No, he's saying don't divorce. Mark 10, verse 11. So he said to them, 
this is Jesus, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. We forget the fact that Jesus had three and a half years of ministry. And so he talked about divorce several times in his ministry. And so each time he gives us a little piece. This time he says, if you divorce someone and you marry somebody else, you're committing adultery against your first wife. But, but, but what if she did something against me? Well, does that change things? See, Jesus was confronting two views of the time. There was one view called the, the school of Shammai that was a teacher that basically said the only permissible reason for divorce was sexual immorality. Basically, if your spouse committed adultery, then you were allowed to divorce her or him in that one situation. That was the one reason you could divorce. Now, the school of Hillel said, no, 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 there's an escape clause. In the book of Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, it basically allows that if you find her unclean, if you find your wife unclean. Now, Shammai interpreted that as unclean, meaning adultery. Hillel said unclean, it, it, basically, if, if she, and this is, this is crazy the way they, they opened it up, basically said if she's unclean compared to that younger, hotter thing down the road. <laughs> that's what they, they did. They really said that. That was okay because, you know what, she's in, compared to her, you could divorce her because she's just getting old. <laughs> wow. No, that, that was one of the things they said. They actually said if she, if she burned your food when she cooked, she's unclean. And so you could divorce her for that reason. And so the, with that in mind, with that in mind, there's the two standards. Basically, Hillel says, hey, you can divorce for any reason you want because the escape clause, all right? And Shammai says, no, only for sexual immorality. And with that in mind, the Pharisees come to Jesus to trap him because there's two schools. And they're trying to say, well, which, which side are you on, Jesus? Matthew 19, verse 3. This is in the same book of Matthew. So Jesus is talking about divorce again sometime later. But the Pharisees come, came to him, testing him, trying to trap him, saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? In other words, the school of Hillel. And he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Okay, they ask Jesus, hey, can you divorce for any reason? And Jesus says, what God has joined together, let nobody separate. But, but, but okay, okay. What we thought you'd get, like, okay, maybe not to go so far as saying the burning the toast and burning the eggs, but what, but what about, like, sexual immorality? What Jesus says. What God has joined together, let no man separate. The intent from the beginning was marriage is for life. The intent was Adam and Eve. God brought Eve to Adam that they would be one flesh. That was the intent. That's where Jesus stops. He doesn't say, accept, 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 accept. He doesn't list a list of pre-qualifiers. He just says, no divorce. See, Jesus has a different... Now, now stay with me, because some of you are like, oh, I don't like this. I'm going to stop listening right now, okay? Some of you have that view. I want you to stay with me, okay? Hang on. But I think it's important that we step back and we take a biblical view, God's view of marriage. How does God see marriage itself? We see the Genesis account. Genesis God brings them together. God chose Adam and Eve. Notice it's not Adam and Steve, it's Adam and Eve. That's a different type of marriage. We'll talk about it another time. And, and I, gotta, I just got to say, when we talk about that going on in our world today, we, we love anybody that comes through the door. There's, okay? There's no judgment. So it doesn't matter what their persuasion, whatever, we love that, peop well, I love that, love that person. Love that person. In the, in the beginning, though, God created Adam and Eve, and he brought the two together. He joined them together. He's the one that, he's the one that did it. Ephesians 5, Paul amplifies this and expands, to, expands upon it. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. So 
Paul is making this illustration about submission, and he's talking about how marriage is supposed to work, but he's also giving us a little picture about God's view of marriage. He talks about Christ and the church. In fact, he goes on in, in uh, verse 31, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. We keep hearing this. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, let the wife see that she respects the husband. God's view of marriage is that marriage is supposed to represent Christ and the church coming together. The point of marriage is to represent Jesus. The point of marriage is to show the world Jesus and the church and Jesus' undying commitment, actually his dying commitment to his bride. Regardless, regardless. In fact, the whole Old Testament is a picture of Jehovah God wooing Israel and Judah, is wooing that, that, the nation of Israel. And as a result, it's a picture. And God says, that I'm committed to you. I'm committed to you. I'm not going to give up on you. Even at the end, if we look at the end of the scriptures, we look at Revelation, God is still committed to Israel. We look at Romans 9 through 11, God is still committed to the nation of Israel. He's still committed to the people of Israel. He's not giving up on them. So, the, so marriage is supposed to represent Christ and the church. It's a mystery. That's what God's view of marriage. And Jesus will never divorce us, even though we may wander. He doesn't divorce us. So the purpose of marriage, it is, it's actually evangelism. It's also sanctification, God working on us to make us more like Jesus. It's procreation, yes, but it's also enjoyment. And sometimes people put the enjoyment part first and lift it up to the highest point and say that's the purpose of marriage. No, it's all of those things. The first and foremost being that it's supposed to represent Christ in the church. Now, we also have to say at this point, well, what does that mean about singleness? Singleness is not second class. And sometimes we have that view, well, if you're single, you're second class. And so if we have that view that single is second class, when we look at divorce and remarriage, we, 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 have this, we have this tension because we think that marriage is the ultimate. No, marriage is just one form. In fact, look at 1 Corinthians 7, 7. Paul, talking about his singleness, says, For I wish that all men were even as I myself, single. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. Skip down to verse 32. But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of his Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married carries, cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Okay, so be, nothing wrong with being single, nothing wrong with being married. If you're single, you can be solely devoted to the Lord, not distracted. But if you're married, you still have to take care of your wife, your spouse. You have to, to minister to their needs. That's not a bad thing. Uh, Gary Thomas is a, the author of the book Sacred Marriage, which is a tremendous book, powerful book, that gives us a biblical view of of marriage, what marriage looks like. He says, if you want to be free to serve Jesus, there's no question, stay single. Marriage takes a lot of time. But if you want to become more like Jesus, I can't imagine any better thing to do than to get married. Being married forces you to face some character issues you'd never have to face otherwise. Interesting comment. You mean being married forces me to look at myself? Yeah. Yeah. Being married forces me to recognize that there's selfishness in me, that when I'm living alone, I can't see because it's all about me. It's my house, my place, my rules. I bring another person in here, another sinful person. That makes marriage like, ah, it's great at times. It's other times, it's, it's not so great. And we get frustrated. And if we had, if we, if just, if we had the feeling of, you know what, I'm, just, I'm tired of this, I wanna, get, I wanna be done, most marriages wouldn't make it past the first year because the honeymoon, honeymoon rarely lasts that long. There may be a few exceptions, but most people, they, they've got the bumps in the road. And it's like, ah. But because there's a commitment to stay, we stay the course. Gary Thomas also writes, any situation that calls me to confront my selfishness has enormous spiritual value. And I slowly began to understand that the real purpose of marriage may not be happiness as much as it is holiness. Not that God has anything against happiness or that happiness and holiness are by nature mutually exclusive, but looking at marriage through the lens of holiness began to put it into an entirely new perspective for me. 
If God's intent in bringing this person to me was to help me become more like Jesus, then my perspective on the rough patches is a little different. You know, as you came in, each of you got a little strip of paper, a little bookmark, but it's not your typical bookmark. It's a piece of sandpaper. Marriage is sandpaper. <laughs> yeah. There's parts of it that, on the, uh, that are just smooth sailing. You know, it's just smooth. But there are other parts of it that are pretty rough. That, you know what? It irritates. And if I keep doing this, I'm going to rub off. Who, who's going to win, the paper or my, or my flesh? The paper is going to win. I'm going to stop now. The, the paper is going to win because it's, it's grit, it's rock, it's sand, and the sand won't give up. My flesh will. That's the point of marriage, to crucify the flesh, to get the flesh out of the way. Now, you may not realize it, but we all got different pieces of sandpaper because some of you are rougher than others. <laughs> some of you, you feel like, I I'm not married to a piece of sandpaper. I'm married to a jackhammer. <laughs> That's all that I feel is just this constant nagging. That's what we feel. That, that, that's, and and there was, as a result, we're like, I want the pain to go away. I want the, the pounding to go away. God has a purpose. He's trying to make you more like Jesus. And if you know, if you know going into it that, you know what, it's going to be a little bit rough at times, marriage, then you're going to be okay. But if you think that it's going to be like the world says, and it's all smooth sailing, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. You've heard, you may have heard me share this story before. My, my son Jefferson, when he went into the Marines, they had at the end of basic training this thing called the crucible. And it's excruciating, this long, like, two-day two thing that you have to go through. And, and you're, you're carrying this huge weight, and you're, you're hiking, um, I don't know how far it is, it's like 30 miles. Or, I mean, just some crazy thing. And the whole thing is just testing you, testing your endurance and mental capacity. Jefferson, when he went into this, he loved the Lord, and so he was praying and he was singing. He, he couldn't sing out loud because it's not allowed, but he, in his heart, he was singing songs as he's marching. <clears throat> I don't know, he probably wasn't singing This Is The Day, but he was, he was singing some song in his heart, and as a result, as he marches through, and at, he would get, they'd get to a rest stop, and because he was focused on the Lord, and he was focused on the fact that this is going to be hard, they'd get to a rest stop, and some of the guys would be like just, just dying, and he would take out, you know, they're taking out their bars and their food, and, and he'd be like, he'd see these guys that are dying, he, he'd share his food, because he's like, I'm, I'm focused on the Lord, and, and I'm okay. And it, he got through that, like, it was hard, but he got through it because he had the focus that it was going to be hard. The next thing he went to, his training for his assignment, he was a Marine now. He went through basic training, all right? So the pain is over, right? The next thing he was expecting, now they're going to treat me like a Marine. They're going to treat me right. They didn't. Whoa. That was the hard thing, because he wasn't expecting it. He wasn't expecting it. You know, we, we, make, these, we make these vows till death do us part richer or poorer, sickness and in health. And it sounds great because right at that moment, I love you and she respects me. And there's this feeling of we're going to get through it together. But what happens is as you go down the road and year after year after year, it's no longer she respects me, she despises me. That's not what I committed to. It was fine. When, when, she, when she liked me, I, it was, it, I can do anything, even if you're sick, but you still like me, we're going to get through this. We're, we're, we're poorer now, but you still like me. We can get through this. We're, we're richer, poorer, sickness and health. Richer, poorer, sickness, I guess it's all. Bad, or better or worse. Things are worse, but you know what? You still like me? We can get through this. But here's what happens. Satan can't steal your marriage. He can't force you to sin, but he can get you, he can steal your joy in the marriage. And that thing, that glue that held you together, that love and respect, honoring each other, begins to be eroded. And so now, I don't feel respected. In fact, I feel despised. I walk in and I can't. And then you factor in the financial pressure. You factor in a health issue. You factor in kids. And whew, I, 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 I can't take it anymore. My wife and I, you know, we, we just moved into a new house 10 days ago. Lots of 
things everywhere, disaster. We had a um, situation where we, we, were, we were watching another, another child, a, a tween, a 12-year-old, and Thanksgiving is happening, and we're down to, you know, from five bedrooms down to two um, because we're working on one, and then I've got my in-law, my, my, not my in-laws, my parents are in town, and it's just like this. We're crowded, and stuff's everywhere. And, and things are a little bit uncomfortable. And then yesterday, we're out, and we're having to shop, and we're having to do things, and we've got all five kids in tow, and, and they're all, like, all over the place. And, and, and things are not where they're supposed to be. So what's happening to Ty? Ty's getting anxious. Ty's getting snippy. Ty's getting... Ty feels like he's addressing the kids at every single moment. And, and I'm like, this, this parenting thing is just not what it's cracked up to be. <laughs> you know, the 18-month-old the used to be cute until, <laughs> until he's crying, until he's, until he's dirty, until he's taking the food and he's throwing it in his hair. And, 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 and I'm just... And, I, and my house is a mess because I've got boxes everywhere and I don't know where that box is that has that thing that... And as a result, I'm like, ah. and I started thinking, the Lord's showing me. That's what people that are going through divorce, that people that are going through, they're, they're at the edge of divorce, it's that I can't take it anymore. I, I, things are out of sorts. They're not like they should be. They, they used to be good, but I don't know what happened. Somewhere we got along. We, she went that way, and I went this way. My needs aren't getting met. Her needs aren't getting met, and you're not meeting my needs, so I'm going to go somewhere else. Over and over again, it happens. It happens, and the marriage breaks down. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We know God's view of marriage is that it's supposed to represent Christ in the church. What's God's view of divorce? Not good. Malachi 2.16, the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. God hates divorce. Why does he hate divorce? Does he hate the divorced person? No, it's not that he hates the divorced person. But it's representing Christ in the church. And he, represent, he knows that divorce, what's going on is there's pain in divorce. The people going through divorce are experiencing pain. And as a result of their pain, they're losing perspective. When you experience pain, you lose perspective. You lose hope. Pain distorts reality and as a result everybody's affected my parents divorced when i was in grade school and i prayed and they got remarried five years later and i was like god answers prayer and five years later i'm at college and i get a letter from my mom saying that they were going to divorce they just hadn't really worked through the problems that they had at the beginning and i i'm, I'm you know sophomore in college, you know, I'm an adult, and I took that letter up to my room, and I wept for an hour. Like, God, what? it's not my marriage, but marriage affects the kids. Marriage affects all those involved, and I, and I, I, I wept, and I, and I cried out to the Lord. I'm like, because there was a thing that happened there, because when divorce happens, Satan throws in lies. He says that you're a failure. He says that You'll never find happiness. He says all these things that, that ultimately end in divorce and then that make the pain of divorce last longer and stir it up. He says that to the kids too. And that, that, that time that I, that me reading that letter, it was the Lord ministering to me, releasing it and like, okay, yeah, they didn't work out their problems. Does that affect me? No, I can, I can give that over to the Lord. But, but, but what does God want? How are, we, how are we supposed to do, deal with this? Matthew 19, 7, God, Jesus is answering. He further expounds upon the answer because that he had first given, basically saying, God, what John, God joined together, let no man put asunder. Let no man separate. And so the Pharisees said to him, verse 7, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and then to put her away? In other words, if, if they're not supposed to get married, if they're not supposed to get divorced at all, then why is it allowed? Why is it permissible? Jesus said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, 
And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Once again, saying the same thing. He keeps reinforcing that if you're divorcing to get remarried because you found something better, you're committing adultery. If you're divorcing your wife, you're going to cause her to commit adultery um, unless she's able to to support herself and be on her own. own. It's, It's that breaking of the marriage. It's it's adultery. Even in the sense of I'm divorcing her and she's, she's, she's fine on her own and she's, she's committed to not remarry. The divorce is really adultery because you're saying that I like my singleness more than what God has given me. So instead of following God, I'm going to do my own thing. Even though it's, even because I'm, I'm, the pain I'm in. Remember, pain distorts reality. In the midst of the pain, we often look to anything to stop it. But a divorce doesn't end anything. If you have kids, when the kids get married, you're both going to be at the wedding. What about the support, child support? What about the alimony? What about taking care of the kids? Oh, they're mine on the weekends, except every other weekend, and, and there's, it doesn't end. Divorce doesn't end anything. It ends maybe a little piece of the pain, but it brings up others. I want you to imagine Think about childbirth. I've never been through it. Um, (laughs) But I'm told that it's excruciating. And this pain is excruciating. But what happens? There's a child that's born, and the the parent forgets, the mom forgets the pain. I mean, yes, remembers the pain, but the pain was so worth it because they see that child. They see that child. And there's some, some women that they have lots of kids because the pain is worth it. They want another child. But what happens when you're going through the pain and you're going through the pain and you're going through the pain and there's no child? There's nothing. There's no deliverance. There's no relief from the pain. What do you do? What do you do? That's where some people are. They've lost hope. They've given up on marriage because there's, the pain doesn't stop. The pain's too great. I can't handle this anymore. And so the only option I see is divorce. See, whatever we focus on, we solve in our minds. If I focus on this problem, I solve it in my mind, and I found an answer that works in my mind, apart from the scriptures, apart from what God says. And the more I think about divorce, the more I think about, yeah, if, I, if, if we get a divorce, it'll end the pain, and, and she and I were just constantly fighting, and you know, that's bad for the kids to see that. It's bad for the kids to see mom and dad always fighting, and so we list all these reasons why it's okay in our mind, that that's to, to, why it's okay in our mind to disobey God. God understands. God doesn't want us to live in, in an unhappy marriage. But what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? And the pain's too great. What does the Bible say? First Peter 3. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. In other words, your husband, he's, he's not walking with the Lord. He's not doing what he's supposed to. What's the wife supposed to say? Oh, he's not walking with the Lord. I've got my escape clause. No, it doesn't say that at all. It says, no, continue to honor him, continue to respect him. And we don't have time to go in the passage, but the rest of that passage talks about that. So often we look to our spouse to fulfill us. We look to our spouse to be Jesus. In other words, to meet all of our needs. But only Jesus can meet all of our needs. And the more we try to find somebody else to meet all of our needs, the more disappointed we're going to be. 1 Corinthians seven ten. Now to the married, I command, this is Paul, he says, yet not I but the Lord. In other words, the Lord didn't specifically say this, but this is an inspired word. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. God knew about today. God knew about your situation. And he wrote this specifically. To the married, I command, a wife is not to depart from her husband. A wife's not to depart. She's not to divorce. But if she does depart, let her remain unmarried. Okay, if, if there's, just, there's just no way, there's just... There's, there was adultery, there was whatever, you fill in the blank. There's all these things that happened and, and that broke the marriage. Okay, and, and you can't take it anymore. Okay, you can, okay, divorce, but stay unmarried. Now, some of you are like, uh, um, but I, I, want, I just want to get out. 
and I'm hoping that there's something better out there. No, the, hope, the point is what's better is in here and letting God work on you this way. And I, I, I don't want that. But God says that's what's better, to stay. It's better to stay. And if you do get divorced, okay, remain unmarried or be reconciled to your husband. Maybe something happens and you find healing and he finds healing and you get back together. Praise God. That's what, it's, that's what the intent is because marriage is supposed to represent Christ and the church. Well, what if the marriage is just, is just toxic? This is the situation that it's just been so much disrespect and there's been so much unloving almost and hateful things that have gone on back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. What do you do in those situations? And the marriage is so toxic that just the sight of the other person is just like, I can't stand him. I can't stand her. How do you deal with that? Basically, at that point, the relationship is not just unhealthy, it's toxic. And that the longer that the people are together, it just makes it worse. It's like if you have a, a scab that's trying to heal and you keep peeling off the scab just makes it worse, and we'll get infected, and the marriage is infected. So how do we deal with that? Divorce? No. No. The Bible says separation. In other words, it, it, think about it this way. I don't think, um, you know, the Bible says, let no man separate. That's not what this is referring to. If you think about um, a person, if, you, if a husband goes on a long trip, is that separation? If he's gone for two months, it's not separate. It's, it's not biblical separation in the sense of ending the, in ending the marriage. No. If a, if a, if a spouse is, is very sick and is in the hospital for several months, is that biblical separation? No. They're still married. In the same case, if, if the, the marriage is so unhealthy and so toxic, they need time apart so they can heal, that's not separation ending the marriage. I used to have that view that, well, separation, you know, you've got to keep the marriage together at all costs, and they've got to stay together. No, sometimes it gets to that point where it's just so unhealthy they need to separate. Now, some people hear that and like, okay, I'm going to separate. I just got to get out. No, most of the time, that's just the sandpaper. God's working on you. You need to stick it out. But there are times where it's just it's so toxic that there needs to be a separation, but there needs to be separation with certain rules, with certain guidelines. And that's the problem is that we, we kind of just do it on our own. You know, we have an example in, in 1 Corinthians 7. It's referring to the sexual union. 1 Corinthians 7, 3, that the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority of his body, but the wife does. In other words, you, you belong to each other. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. In other words, fasting and prayer so I can get closer to the Lord. So this type of separation that I'm talking about is only with the intent to get closer to the Lord with the intent of coming back together. If you're separating and just say, I can't take it anymore, I'm going to try this thing all by myself. No. That's sinful. That's you just saying, I'm going to do my own thing. You know, and, and you know what will happen? Honestly, in most cases, you separate yourself, the pain goes away because I've got medication now. I've got medication that's keeping me from dealing with the sandpaper. I'm far away from the sandpaper, so I don't feel that rubbing wrong at all anymore. And you're missing what God's trying to do in your life. That's unbiblical. That's sinful. That's running away from the problem. So separation must have a plan. The plan for, and I'm just going to throw out these real quick, four things, four main points. There must be a plan for how to live apart. How are we going to live apart for this season, just for the season to work through things? We have, must have a plan for accountability so that we're not wandering. We must have a plan for how to handle finances that you're agreed upon. Not just like, well, I make my money and you make your money and we're going to each pay for our own. No, we have to have a plan to work together. We must have a plan for how to seek personal healing. I can't just go apart, and if I'm apart for a season, I'll heal up on my own. No. No, you can't. Pain distorts reality. You're in so much pain. You've been through pain. You can't see clearly. You need some help. You need a pair of glasses. When your vision is cloudy, you can't just open your eyes and say, I see fine. That's what got you in the problem in the first place. You believed you were the authority. You need to go to God's authority. I also want to say in a, in a separation, a biblical separation for that season, there must be some ground rules. You can't use the children as pawns. So often the children are, are used and, oh, daddy's just, he's, he just doesn't love us anymore. What is that? That's straight from the pit of hell. And that, but that's what couples do. 
manipulate. Use the kids as pawns. We need to respect time out on certain topics and only deal with topics. You need to be going through counseling, focusing on your, on, on your healing and not your spouse's healing. We get so focused on, well, she's, she's got to be doing her thing. No, you've got to be doing your thing. Let God deal with her. The more you focus on her, the more frustrated you're going to be. Well, then some people finally say, well, what, what, what about abuse? A case of abuse. That, that's, a, that's a clear case where divorce is warranted. Show me that verse in the Bible. Now, some of you are like, whoa, Ty. But you, I, my friend, she was battered. She, was, she, she almost died. I understand. I'm not saying that you stay in the house in that situation. Separation is, that's, that's separation. First Peter 3, we, we talked about it before. Wives, be submissive to your own husbands. You can read through that passage, but you get down to the end. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, call, verse 6, Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. That's a strange passage. How does it end with any terror? No, the husband's supposed to, I mean, the wife is supposed to honor the husband. In fact, if we look at, first, at Ephesians 5, the husband's supposed to give unconditional love to the wife, and the wife is supposed to give unconditional respect to the husband. Well, what if he's not respectable? God doesn't qualify and say. In fact, this passage in 1 Peter 3 basically says, even if he's not walking with the Lord, even if he's not respectable, she's supposed to respect him. Even when they're being walked all over? Even when they're being walked all over? That doesn't mean you stay and become a punching bag. I'm not saying that. Well, there's emotional abuse going on, and I can't take it anymore. Then that's where the, the church, the elders of the church get involved, and church discipline gets involved. Separation, yes, that can happen for a season, for a purpose. Satan lies and says divorce will stop the pain and make it better. It's not true. The pain will continue. So, what about remarriage? Just wrapping up. When is remarriage permissible? After divorce. After divorce happens, what do we do? Well, Bible says remarriage is biblically permissible, number one, when a spouse has died. Romans 7, 2 says, For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, while, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. So, obviously, we know in the case well, when, a, when a spouse dies, the person immediately is free to remarry. Now, immediately gives the wrong connotation. There needs to be healing that needs to take place in that person's life. Healing from the loss. And there's huge loss being married to that person. And so if the, if the person goes and gets married, yeah, I can't set a time frame, but three months later, my question would be, have they really healed? Have they really healed? Or are they just looking for a fix to, 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 to feel better? No, they, their healing needs to happen before remarriage. Now let's say a, a couple is married and they get divorced. They're not, to, they're not to remarry unless one spouse dies. Now if the spouse dies, that person is free to remarry based on this passage. Well, when else is remarriage biblically permissible? Um, 1 Corinthians 7, 15, the unbelieving spouse abandons the marriage. When the unbelieving spouse abandons the marriage, um, 1 Corinthians 7, 10, now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. We've read that before. Husband's not to divorce his wife. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. If the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. If... So if we're married to an unbeliever, we're basically called to stay in that marriage. Okay? Biblically speaking, we're not, we're not to marry an unbeliever. If you're a believer, you're not, you're not supposed to marry an unbeliever. What fellowship does darkness have with light? We're not supposed to. But if you find yourself now saved and you're married to an unbeliever, you're supposed to stick it out because it's supposed to honor 
represent Christ in the church, and that you as representing Christ are going to continue to love that spouse even if they don't believe, just like Jesus continues to pursue us, continues to love us. But if the unbelieving spouse says, I can't take this Jesus stuff anymore, then you let them go. And it says then you're not under bondage. What is the bondage? The only bondage it's referring to is once again, once bound by the law. You're no longer bound by the law in that case. Now that doesn't mean you should just turn up the Jesus volume in your marriage so that, you can, so that they leave and you chase them away. You're not allowed to do that either. But the intent is that you show them Jesus. You show them Jesus. All right, what about third situation? If the divorced spouse remarries someone else. In that case, the marriage, now the marriage covenant is now broken because they're married to another. And in that case, the marriage is, is irreparable. There needs to be repentance for the divorce that happened, but marriage is, is permissible because the divorce has been, um, the 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 marriage has been totally severed, severed, permanently severed. There's a verse in Deuteronomy that says, once that person has been married to another person, this marriage can't happen again. And so, in that case, the um, divorced person is allowed to remarry. Now, there are three other situations that people ask about. Now, those, those are the only three that the, the Bible clearly states in terms of remarriage. Those are the only three. Spouse dies. Spouse is an unbeliever, and they leave. Spouse, you, you have a divorce that happens, and the other spouse remarries. Those are the only three. What about the previous marriage ended in adultery? You know, uh, the, except for marital in, unfaithfulness and sexual immorality, um, then I'm free, right? No, remember, 1 Corinthians 7, we, we just looked at it. If you divorce, you're to remain unmarried. People don't like that. But, but, but I, am I consigned to a, a life of singleness because, because, I divorced, because I divorced my husband because he was unfaithful to me? Once again, we're, we have the wrong view of singleness. Jesus was single. Paul was single. Many great people of the faith were single. But the idea is that if, if, if I'm divorced from my spouse, I'm, I'm to remain unmarried or be reconciled. It doesn't seem fair. Part of me, especially in the case where the, the spouse was unfaithful, is it wants to be more gracious. But then I step back and say, I want to be more gracious than the word of God. I don't know that I want to go there. I'm basically saying that I have a, a, a higher, I have a, I have a better standard. I'm more gracious than God. I can't go there. I can't put my words on the word of God and twist it that way. No, no. This is what, I'm just, this is what the, the word says. And if you find yourself in that situation, God's working on you. In fact, I must say, if you find yourself, I, I can't tell you how many people I've been, how many couples I've counseled or friends that I've had that have been in situations where there's been marital unfaithfulness and the husband or the wife is, is, has an affair. And the, the other spouse that's left is just devastated. And is the pain is so great that they want to get out. The pain is so great, they want to get I understand. The counsel from the scripture is stay, wait, seek healing. Let the Lord deal with the healing in your heart and in their heart. Well, what if there's repeated abuse and, or repeated um, um, violation of the marriage covenant? What do you do in that situation? You, you are free to divorce. That's, that is the situation. You are free to divorce, but you're to remain unmarried. Is that fair? what God's word says. I don't make the rules. And then you pray for that spouse to return. A couple years ago, Pastor Dave had a dear friend, a, a, a saint, a sister saint in the Lord who basically was in that situation. The husband had been cheating and walked away from the marriage. And she, she just hung on. She remained single. She, she continued to seek the Lord, believing that God was going to one day restore her marriage. I believe it was eight years later, God did. God does that. God can do miracles. God can do a miracle in that person that you believe is so far from God. Don't look at the scriptures as chains that bind you. Look at them as guardrails that protect you. What about divorce prior to salvation? 
This is one where I really want to say yes. You know, you're a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. Therefore, it's okay to be remarried. You were divorced. It was just, it was your old life. You didn't know any better. I want to say yes. And there are some Bible teachers that will say, yes, you're free. My problem is that when Jesus talked to the Pharisees, none of them were believers. None of them were saved. It was all their BC days. I, I don't see a Bible verse. What about abuse? Situations of abuse. Once again, when we talked about that, it doesn't mean automatic get out of jail free card. No, it means maybe separation, work on your healing, let God work on them. Last thing I want to say, and then we'll, we'll end. When we go back to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus brings up the topic of divorce. You can study it on your own later today. Right after he talks about divorce, what does he talk about? He talks about oaths and vows. He says, keep them. He says, don't swear by anything. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Will you take this woman to be your wife, to commit to her, love her, richer, poor, sickness and health, better or worse? I do. Yes. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Right after he talks about that, he talks about how to handle conflict. <laughs> He says in verse Matthew 5, 38, he says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Sometimes marriage looks like that. And we get back, tit for tat. But I tell you, not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other as well also. That whole passage, you know the passage, sometimes we treat enemies better than we treat our spouse. Jesus, in the context of healthy, pure relationships, that's right where he goes next. Finally, what if they persecute you? What if they spitefully use you? He says, he talks about loving your enemies. Sometimes, we, you may have heard the term frenemies, friends that have become enemies, that you've, you've, you're against each other. Marriage is not supposed to be against each other. But if I have the perspective that you're not against me, but you're trying to rub off the things that are not like Jesus, if I have that perspective, if I have the perspective that marriage is going to be hard, it's going to have rough patches, you can get through it with the grace of God. Application, what do we do with this? I, I imagine that you could be in one of three areas. One is your marriage is on life support, your spouse is rubbing you the wrong way and it's irritating. Remind yourself that maybe God is trying to rub off some of your rough spots. Maybe you're in the midst of a divorce. Get help. Get perspective. Divorce doesn't make it over. It simply makes it complicated. And do you have a divorce in your past? Have you repented of your part of the sin? Almost every, not every divorce is sin, but almost every divorce involves some sin on the part of both parties. Almost every divorce. Have you repented of your part of the sin? And then have you received the forgiveness offered at the cross? Have you found healing? With so many people having experienced divorce, there's a lot of pain in here. And as we talked about this today, there's a lot of people that I just ripped off a Band-Aid. And it, it may be festering. There may be an infection that you didn't want to deal with. And God brought it up. I, I wasn't in your home spying this week, okay? But God was there. And he sees, and he wants to bring healing. And sometimes the only way to bring healing is to pull off the Band-Aid and said, okay, Let's, let's begin to operate. Let's pray. Lord God, how we need you. How we need you, Lord. This thing called marriage is so difficult. It's so challenging. And when things go sideways, when things go wrong, Lord, we don't know how to put it back together again. God, may you give us the humility to recognize that you know better than we do. May you give us the, the humility and the trust in you to believe that your word is there to protect us and to guard us and to guide us, not to be a yoke, but to be a guardrail. Lord, give us the faith to recognize the lies that Satan is spinning, even right now, to get us discouraged, to get us to give up hope. Lord, I pray for the marriages in this room, those that are on the edge, that you would breathe life, that you would breathe hope, that they would understand that there's more to this marriage thing than just their personal happiness. 
and that you see the pain and that you're going to take them through the valley of the shadow of death. Lord, for those marriages that are in denial and things are, are not good and really they're on life support but they don't even realize it, Lord, may you wake them up. May you wake them up and show them that you are the God that heals not only physical bodies, but you heal marriages as well. And for those that have experienced divorce and are still suffering the pain, Lord, may you bring repentance, may you bring faith, may you bring healing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tough word. Take God's word. Trust God's word. Amen. Amen. Where's your wife? Hmm? Where's your wife? She ran away. <laughs> she was separated. Here. Are you separated? Uh, I'm uh, separated right now. You're there reconciling. She is. They're reconciling. There, there they are. There she is. Oh. Oh. Where's my wife? There she is. There she is. Um, thanks, brother. That was a good word. I, I stand and tie everything that he's sharing there and appreciate that. And I just wanted to bring um, the pastors and wives up and let you guys know that um, our heart is to honor God in his word. And I know that Pastor Ty taught some things today that are difficult to hear. And uh, it's, some would say, well, that's old school. No, it's just biblical. And there's some of you in here that have been lied to about what marriage is. You've had pastors tell you it was okay to divorce your spouse and then remarry you to someone else. And you're going, but the pat. I don't care what a pastor says. None of us care. We care about what Jesus says. And we realize that people will hear a teaching like this and go, wait a minute, so you're saying I divorced and married, you're saying I'm living in adultery right now with my spouse, even though we're both Christians? Yes. You're living in adultery right now. And, and I know some of you can go, I'm out of here. I'm sorry to hear that. Because we're committed to teach what the Bible teaches regardless of the fallout. doesn't matter. This is where it is. We want, you know, there was a couple here three years ago, mm. love the Lord, and I taught the very same thing Ty was teaching, and they go, wait a minute, so, but there's a church down, you know, in Broward County, they married us, they said, no, it was wrong, they were wrong, you never should, and so the husband said, you know what, I need to reach out to my ex-wife, who's a Christian, and repent for divorcing her, I never should have. And she responded, please forgive me because I never should have divorced you. Now, both these couples are already married to someone else. So they had to go through, I feel guilty. And so am I saying I regret marrying the person I'm with now? And I'll tell you what it was. It was Eric and Kathy Hamill. They don't mind me telling you. We're an open, we're an open book here. And I've already talked to them. They, don't, they can talk to you about it. But if this is your scenario, talk to them. Because Eric wrote his wife and said, hey, you know what? I, I, I'm, forgive me because I failed you. And she says, forgive me. And they both wish they never would have divorced each other. But it doesn't mean they're not blessed who they're married to now. You see what I'm saying? It, it, it just means they needed to truly repent. Or he needed to repent of that act. She needed to repent of that. And, but they're still moving on with their marriage, honoring the Lord that they're married today. Doesn't mean well, I get I get divorced then. No, it means you need to repent of that. And if you're single and separated, out shopping, you need to stop. And here what Pastor Ty taught, if you remarry, especially now that you know this, you're committing adultery. And so many of our relationships are wondering why they're cursed, they're not working out, because you've never repented and you departed from God's word for a liberal Christian interpretation of marriage versus what the Bible teaches. And so Take heart to this. And I would ask you, and that's why I asked the pastors to come up, is pray for us because we realize our marriages are on the front line. Mm -hmm. We hear about pastors getting divorced and falling into adultery and all these things. And, and we're committed. We want our marriages, guys, to be a picture, a gospel track of Jesus who says, I'll die for you. And be that sandpaper, great illustration. You know, we're just dying to self constantly. And so we want, you know, as marriage is up here, we're still on our honeymoon after decades. Well, not you guys. You're still on your honeymoon, literally. <laughs> but, but we're, you know, it's because we've, we've chosen to go. We care more about holiness than our happiness. That, that's, that's where we're standing here in our marriages. We're going, being happy is great. Being in love, all that's great. But that's not number one. Number one is, Jesus, we're going to honor you in this covenant. And you know, Kathy and I, we've been through, a lot of you don't know this, we've been through hell. We've been through hell in our marriage, catastrophic issues, and, and been tested in everything the pastor Ty's teaching. And I'm telling you, 
it's worth trusting the Lord and honoring his word. It's worth it. Amen. Um, in closing, guys, if we, uh, we're available here to talk, maybe you have a, a biblical question about this and something's not sitting right with you. We want to be available you here. We don't have much time before the next service. So it might even be setting up an appointment. Maybe you're in a situation like Eric and Kath and you're going, we need counsel. We need some instruction and some guidance because we want to maneuver this and get through this and honor the Lord. Make an appointment. We'll sit down. We'll work with you through this. It's important. Okay? It's important. Let's all stand. Father, we thank you so much for your word. It's a hard pill to swallow sometimes, but we know it's good for us. So we just ask that you would take the truth of your word and you would help us to walk away from our bitterness, our presumptions, our bad doctrine, our bitter roots. Mm. And we ask that you would help us to be free. Deliver us, Lord. The fear that binds us, deliver us. Help us, God. We want to walk as you walk, Jesus. We want to carry our cross. We want to care more about what pleases you than what's comfortable for us. So we pray your blessing on the seeds that have been planted today. In Jesus' name we pray. And every saint said, Amen. God bless your family. Have a great week with Jesus.